Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Daniel, chapter 10 and chapter 12. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I've come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for the days yet to come. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such has never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Here ends the Old Testament reading. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. The epistle readings from the book of Revelations, chapter 12. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan. The deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in a great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Here ends the epistle reading. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. We sing the Alleluia and speak the verse. Hallelujah. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to himself a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... It would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. 
And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be cast into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man came to save the lost. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to thee. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. In the church's life together, there are certain days each year that have been assigned to be just a little bit more prominent on the calendar. Sure, I'm at least mostly convinced and mostly persuaded that you all know December the 25th, Christmas, right? Many of you will also know January the 6th, Epiphany, after the 12 days of Christmas. A few of you perhaps even know that the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox, it's the day that we call Easter, the celebration of our Lord's resurrection. But has anyone ever paid any special attention to today? September the 29th, a red letter day in the church to be sure. And a red letter day for little Adeline Amelia as well. It's a day set aside by the church for the commemoration of St. Michael and all angels. Since the 29th fell on a Sunday this year, we've elected to honor this commemoration within our congregation. And so in place of the assigned lectionary readings for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost, we have the readings that you just heard. That's right, today we're talking about angels. It's a topic that doesn't often come up in Lutheran preaching. And I think part of that is is because apart from the angel of the Lord who appears frequently throughout the Old Testament, as an apparent divine messenger from the Lord himself, angels are somewhat sparse in the pages of Scripture. We see angels in stained glass, in paintings and in sculptures around churches and art museums. But what are they? Why do they always look like babies? I actually don't know the answer to that one. What do they do? What's the point of angels? And maybe to push the issue even just a little further, Why does it matter for us that there are angels? Well, today we'll do our best to answer at least a few of these questions. First, what are angels? Angels are created beings. That sentence means that they are not God. For there is God and there is the rest of creation. Angels are a part of God's creation, but they are not human beings. Nor is there any indication from scripture that we somehow become angels when we die, though some have said as much in an attempt to give comfort to grieving loved ones. Nevertheless, angels are created beings who were created to do God's will. Okay? So angels are in a class separate from us. We need to remember that. In most cases, it seems as if angels are indeed present but not always easily seen. Remember in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah is serving in the temple and all of a sudden the the figurative curtain is pulled back. Isaiah is allowed to see the heavenly throne room itself and then he sees angels flying around the throne room and singing praises to God. In 2 Kings chapter 6, perhaps a little more obscure passage, Elisha prayed that God would open the eyes of his servant to see the army of angels who were prepared to fight on their behalf. Indeed, an exceedingly great army. Of course, that's not always the case. Angels aren't always hidden from us. Angels can be seen when Mary is given the promise of Jesus' birth, when Joseph is told not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife. 
Indeed, on the night of Jesus' birth, while there are shepherds out watching their flocks by night, angels show up. After Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, angels show up to minister to him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, one gospel writer mentions that angels tended to him. And of course, at the resurrection, at the ascension of our Lord, there again are angels. But what do they do? What's the point of angels? Well, let's simplify the work of angels into three distinct roles. Angels exist for praise, for proclamation, and for protection. These are the reasons that God has ordained such servants to work in his kingdom. Again, look at Isaiah chapter 6. There Isaiah is serving as priest, and all of a sudden he sees the throne room with the Lord himself sitting on the throne. And remember that uh, fantastic detail? The train of his robe filled the room. There was incense being burned. There were angels flying to and fro. Remember the six-winged seraphim, those angels that use two wings to fly, two wings to cover their feet because feet are, you know, dirty and unclean, and two wings to cover their own faces lest they gaze upon the face of God. Remember at Christmas, the angels show up and sing the hymn that we just sang a few moments ago, Glory be to God in the highest and on earth peace to men upon whom his favor rests. And then finally, is there a better image of angels than the image we see throughout Revelation? The book of Revelation keeps giving us snippets, little, little uh, views, previews, if you will, of what's going on in heaven even as I speak right now. And what do we see all the time? The angels, the archangels of God, as we say in our communion liturgy, Worshiping Jesus. Angels exist for praise. But also, angels exist for proclamation. I mentioned earlier we have the angel of the Lord from the Old Testament who always shows up as a messenger of God. But also we have the angel Gabriel who speaks with Mary, who speaks with Joseph. We have the angels who stand guard over the tomb of Jesus after he has risen and they say, why do you seek the living among the dead? And then at Jesus' ascension, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, there are the faithful apostles. They're standing around. They have seen Jesus go up into the sky and they can no longer see him. And they're standing there looking into the sky for who knows how long until someone who has the appearance of a young man says, why are you staring up into the sky? Well, it seems like a good question, but it turns out this is an angel. This is a messenger. That's what the Greek word angelos actually means. This is a messenger sent from God because he says not just why are you staring up in the sky, but don't you know that he will come again in the same way that he has left you? Angels exist for proclamation. But finally, angels exist for protection. And this is where the texts for today sort of begin to align. We have the Old Testament lesson from Daniel, an interesting account of a battle being waged. We have Revelation chapter 12, another viewpoint of the very same battle. And then we have this strange text, Matthew chapter 18, which as long as I've been a pastor, the only reason I can figure that this is St. Michael's gospel text is because of that one verse towards the end, not having anything to do with um, the greatest is the one who humbles himself like a child, not having anything to do with causing one of these little ones to sin. But then that little verse, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. This is the proof text verse for guardian angels, by the way. The fact that apparently we have angels that God has placed over us. Now will we see them in action? Will we know when they're working on our behalf? Honestly, probably not. But I'm here to tell you today that they are. 
I'm here to tell you today that they are doing the work of God because they are faithful. They are his faithful servants created during the first week of existence and they are created to do the work of God. Guardian angels that fight for us. Paul reminds us over and over again that our fight as Christians living in this dark world is not against flesh and blood but it's against powers and principalities, evil dark forces that are out to get us. And when I say out to get us, I mean to rob us of the gift that was given this very morning to little Adeline Amelia. Man, she has conked out. Sleeping peacefully, resting in our Lord. The gift that was given to Adeline this morning is the gift of faith. The gift of being named one of God's dear children. It's a promise that God makes to us. And the devil's only job, his only wish, is to snatch or to corrupt or to shipwreck that faith. And he's out to get us. Ever since Genesis 3, the devil has been out to whisper a lie into our ear to make us trust in anything else other than Jesus Christ for salvation. But take heart, dear friends, in Christ. For as many times as we are misled and as many times as we are uh, uh, distracted from all of the important stuff, Jesus is always working to draw us back to himself. At the heart of each of these actions are this. We have praise, we have proclamation, we have protection. That angels do the work of the Almighty God that he has sent them to do to further his kingdom. We pray in the Lord's Prayer Thy kingdom come. And Luther reminds us that God's kingdom comes already, even without our prayer. But we pray in these words so that his kingdom might come among us, so that we might look for his kingdom to come and we might rejoice. So angels are the instruments whom God uses to do his will. In praise, in proclamation, and in protection, angels point to Jesus to his cross and to his empty tomb, to the place where eternal life has been won and is freely given to us. That's why there are angels. But in our experience, angels remain mostly unseen. And that's for good reason. That's for good reason. Because how do we know which is an angel of God and which is a demon sent from the devil? In Galatians chapter 1, Remember the book of Galatians. Paul is writing to a church who has turned aside from the gospel and they've started believing a lie instead. Remember Paul's very, very stern words. Who has bewitched you, O foolish Galatians? Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, around verse 8, he says that if I or if someone else, another teacher, or even an angel comes and delivers to you a gospel message that is different from the gospel that we delivered to you. Reject them outright. Do not hear a word of it. Paul says that the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, that he rose for your justification, that no angel would ever utter anything different, that no other preacher should ever utter anything different, that Paul should never utter anything different. But if they do, ignore them. So also in 2 Peter chapter 1, does Paul talk about the fact that even though he got to be on the mountaintop with Jesus at transfiguration, even though there are those who see visions and hear voices, Paul says nevertheless, or Peter rather says nevertheless, that we have a more sure foundation. And it's not the word of an angel. He said, it is the word of the Lord. It is the proclamation of Jesus Christ. So, we can have our experiences. We can assign to those, potentially, whatever uh, Christian understanding and, well, explanation we can come up with. But we have God's word. And that's why angels have to remain behind the scenes. That's why angels are not the study or the focus of every Sunday. Because if we talk too much about angels, we might forget about Jesus. And after all, he's the reason that we're here. Jesus is the reason that we do everything in this church. 
That's why we're called Holy Cross Lutheran Church. That all might be drawn to that Holy Cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to learn a little bit more about angels, I would commend to you the hymn that we sang just moments ago. Number 254, Lord God, we all to thee give praise. Read through that. It tells you a little bit more about how angels work behind the scenes. About how angels are the blessed servants of the Lord who do the things that God would have not only them to do, but us as well. Because think about it like this. I said that angels are God's instruments who do his will. And isn't that what God in Christ has created us also to be about? To be about praise. That's why you're here. To be about proclamation to the very ends of the earth. Telling those who are far off and those who maybe live in our own households that Christ, the crucified one, is risen for them. And then finally, protection. This is one that sometimes we fall off the wagon with. This is one that sometimes is a little bit uncomfortable or a little bit difficult to achieve. But we have been called workers in Christ's vineyard to be about protecting the faith of our weaker brothers and sisters. We have been called not to despise these little ones who make such a wonderful, joyous noise to the Lord each and every Sunday. We have been called not to allow them to stumble, but instead to build them up, to bind them up, to instruct them in the ways of the Lord, that they too might have the same inheritance that we do, that on the last day when Christ comes again, he would raise us up to life imperishable, and we would see each and every one of these little children there among us. They're named as the children of God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until he comes. Amen.